Hello. So good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the GRIPS Forum. So my name is Daisuke Miyamoto, the professor at this institute, the National Insti uh, Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS. So I specialize in cybersecurity and uh, will be uh, serving as a uh, moderator today. So GRIPS Forum aims at uh, informing policy debates by uh, inviting readers in various fields. Uh, it is a public event and uh, at the same time. So give us our students opportunities to join and benefit from the lecture and the discussions. Now today's topic is an artificial intelligence. It is a really new topic and it is really changing topics. And it is really difficult to understand it because it is really, as I said, changing it. So now we invite Dr. Hiroshi Nakagawa, so team leader, Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence and Projects and an ask about the AI ethics, roles, trust, and agent. Dr. Nakagawa graduated from the University of Tokyo and obtained his PhD degrees, uh, Doctor in Engineering in the 1980s. So he started his career to join Yokohama National University in the 1980s. So from 1999 to an... Uh, 2018, so he was a professor at the Information Infrastructure Center at the University of Tokyo. From 2017, he became a team leader of the Weekend Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. Dr. Nakagawa will speak for 45 minutes on AI ethics, roles, trust, and agent. So following his talk, we will invite and uh, have a panel discussion with GRIPS faculty member and the student. Then we will have an uh, open Q&A session with a wider audience. The presentation of this session will be recorded. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, so please welcome Dr. Hiroshi Nakagawa. Thank you, uh, Miyamoto Sensei. I'm Hiroshi Nakaga, and I'm working at Riken AIP. Now, artificial intelligence, not artificial intelligence, but advanced intelligence, because the, our center chief, uh, the chief of our center is insisted to not to use AI. <laughs> he is a very theorist, mathematical theorist, and would like to use the basics of the machine learning and AI. So the name is coming like this. And it's a 10-year project. And it's now the eight years and eight and a half years old, and so it means that only one year and a half is left for us to, how to say, make some progress or some kind of research. So one and a half year is very short period, I think, but in the AI field, it's not so short. Just two years ago, uh, only two years ago, so the generative AI chat GPT coming, suddenly coming to us. And the things are changing very rapidly and profoundly since then. So the one and a half year, after one and a half year, what kind of things will happen is unexpected. I couldn't expect at all. But at this moment, I would like to speak about two topics. The first, EU AI Act, which is a strong influence to all over the world related to AI communities, AI industries, and every uh, person in the world. And um, if we have enough time, I would like to move to the second topic, AI as a legal agent. This is not so popular topic, but in Western the academic society, there is a strong history about this topic. Now, I would like to start first topic. AI sex rose to ascend. Mm. 
So the history of history from ethics to laws. Uh, okay, as you know, the 2016 EU uh, started to GDPR, General uh, Data Protection Regulation. It's a law and very effective in all over the world, including here in Japan. And 2017, Future Life Institute, FLI, uh, published Ashiroma AI Principles. That is, a, that is say, first, first documentation saying about the AI ethics. So E means ethics, L means law, as you know. 2017, IEEE, the ethically aligned design version 2, was published. It's much longer than the Ashiroma Principle. And 2018, European Commission high-level expert group published ethics guideline for trustworthy AI. And it's very, how to say, interesting papers and uh, say something about AI itself. And 2019, the ethically aligned design, first version, uh, actually this is the last version of uh, E. And I wrote a very small part of this book. And uh, 2019, Japan Cabinet Office published Human-Centered AI Social Principles. Uh, that is well-read the document published from the government. And I write some part of it. And then the 2019 OECD recommendation of Council of Artificial Intelligence, OECD, Legal 0449, it's a ethics. And 2020, EU uh, published AI white paper. This is not the ethics. It's much more related to politics or legal things. And finally, 2021, EU published the draft of AI Act. And it's based on this white paper idea. And many of you don't know, but the very important thing is 2021, ISHI, ISHI is not EU. ISHI is uh, all over the world, including US, Canada, Japan, and so on and so forth. Uh, started to discuss the AI treaty. And if we approve this AI treaty, we are obliged to the, this AI treaty, but not yet. Now, the mentality, first I'd like to start with mentality. EU, without law, no technology is applied in the society. That's the EU's attitude. And I spoke, about, spoke with many EU, EU researchers, and almost all, all, almost all of them said this thing. US is opposite side. Social application of technology should be the tried. And if something happened, something wrong happened, court cases, and finally, if needed, regulation. So Japan is, uh, how to say, someone said Japan is somewhere between this and this, EU and AI. But Japanese companies uh, lean towards the US. Uh, namely, the <clears throat> lean towards the U.S. mentality, but in reality, Japanese law based on the EU laws, on continental laws. So the, there is some kind of split, uh, mentally split by EU and uh, U.S. So the many Japanese people, the many, the many Japanese lawyers prefer to even recommend it to introduce EU type laws. Not so many Japanese lawyers, but some Japanese lawyers are very, how to say, familiar with EU attitude. But I think the, not a majority, but a very big part of Japanese people wouldn't like this kind of idea. That's the situation at this moment. Now, as I said before, the, there is three 
uh, documents coming from EU first one, the ethics guidelines for trust as EA 2018 and the EOA white paper 2020 and the EU AI Act. And the EU Act is like this. The, this was coming from the Brussels. Brussels is a headquarters of EU. And uh, it was coming at 21st April 2021. And finally, approved this year, March 6th. Okay. So you can easily access this artificial intelligence act by searching by Google or other things. Now, one of the main purpose of AI Act is this. While there are 27 countries in EU, and almost all of them already have some kind of the each country's law about AI. So, but the regulation is split country by country, and it's very well, bad situation. If we would like to sell something, uh, produced by country A to selling country B or something like that. So the national regulations that are different in each country may fragment the domestic market, as I said. And uh, operators developing or using AI systems are subject to the laws of individual countries and its miserable situation. And to combat this, ensure the consistent high-level protection rules across the EU. That is a very important, the, how to say, aim of this EU AI Act. It's reasonable, I think. And then they split it, the, all the AI system into four categories, four layers. The first layer is prohibited. Uh, prohibited cases, as uh, I sp speak more details in the next slide. And then the high level, high risk AI. High risk AI is very, how to say, covers a very big part of AI. And actually, the AI Act, 85% of EU AI Act document is devoted to treat this high risk AI. And then the third part is the limited risk AI. So in this case, it's not so strongly uh, the regulated AI system. Uh, transparency is required for developing explainable and uh, understandable AI uh, is needed. <clears throat> but anyway, explainability, understandability, if you would like to put this kind of facility in AI, it takes too much cost for industries. The finally, minimal risk. Minimal risk is, uh, well, not so strongly or almost no regulated, but corporate specific code of conduct is required, and someone says that which is very hard to do. <clears throat> now, Prohibited AI, which is specified, which is specified in Article Five, AI application that threaten citizen right. Citizen right is very important concept across the EU people. Then the, there are several types of prohibited AI. First is including biometric categorization system based on sensitive characteristics, biometric one. Untargeted scraping of facial image from the internet or CCTV footage to create facial recognition databases. So facial recognition in the public place is prohibited. Emotion recognition in the workplace and schools. And social scoring is also prohibited. Predicting policy, predict, predictive policy, which is also prohibited. Predictive is very important. Policing is okay, but predict policy is not okay. 
AI that manipulates human behavior or exploits people's vulnerability will also be forbidden. So these types are forbidden by the Article 5. Not so many, but very important categories are over here. Now, I move to the most important part, high-risk AI category. There is uh, actually eight or nine categories in, in this high-risk AI category. The first one is biometrics and its classification, real-time and after the fact. This type of AI should not do any discrimination. This is not a public play. This is included in not public places used. The previous one, This previous one is uh, where well, the fa facial recognition is public place case. But this is not limited to public place. The second one, management and operation of artificial life, a uh, critical life infrastructure. So the, that means they are intended for use as safety equipment in the management and operation of laws. Okay, it's very important. AI for transportation and supply of water, gas, heating, and electricity. Okay, maybe you realize that this transportation or uh, transportation management of operation of road heavily related to automatic vehicle or self-driving vehicle and maybe this kind of AI is very deeply influenced in the car companies, if the car, car, car company would like to make automotive uh, driving vehicle. Third one, AI decides whether to allow access to education and vocational training. Yeah, education case. Fourth one, use in recruitment personal evaluation, worker management, hiring and firing. Yeah, that's very severe for some of, some of the workers here. Fifth one, access eligibility ranking for essential private and public services. It's not easy to imagine what kind of AI this means, but Okay, the two, two, three years ago, COVID-19 was a uh, well, very strong influence to our society. And at that moment, triage, triage, who is hospitalized, who is not, that is a triage decision. And if AI is used, this kind of decision, it is a high risk AI. Sixth, law enforcement which affects individual situation. Yeah. It's not, so e uh, it's not so difficult to understand. So seven, use in migration asylum or border control. Yeah, border control is very important. And if you would like to use AI in border control, it's high risk. It's reasonable, I think. So eight, AI to assist judicial authority in investigating and interpreting the facts. So the judicial case, or AI, AI which is used by lawyers or the court, is also high risk AI. Yeah, it's okay in my sense. So what must be done before saying or using high risk AI on the EU? And actually, this is the EU's true intention in this AI Act. There are many detailed instructions for each of the following stakeholders, stakeholders including not, man, not only manufacturers, but also distributors, service business developers, that means provider, business representatives, public users, excluding users who only use the system the, for personal use. Yeah. That means, okay, some the municipal uh, office use AI uh, that is a public uh, users and uh, make some services with that AI that's a public use. 
And it's, it is also applicable to foreign suppliers outside of EU. So that this EU AI Act affects all the countries in the world. So what must be what must we do is uh, listed by this uh, these slides. The risk management system for the entire usage period of AI system article nine. Entire usage. Yeah, it's a very important concept in EU AI Act. Entire usage, whole life of AI is managed by controlled by or regulated by EU AI Act. Data governance, no bias, no error, adequate representativeness, that is in Article 10. Preparation of technical document, Article 11. Ability to store usage record, Article 12. Yeah, 11 and 12 is so heavy burden for AI manufacturing manufacturers as you realize. Must continue. The explanation of content and appropriate instruction to users and development rules for human supervision, Article 13. Human supervision is terms EU people prefers most. Limits of output to be monitored by human Installation of emerging stop button, monitoring checked by two or more persons. Hmm, Article 14. But, I wrote here, human supervision and monitoring is not realistic, rather nominal, because AI is acting much faster than human. Okay? So, from this sense, this is mm, very hard to say. I'm not certain it really works or not. And continuously learning AI accuracy, taking robustness, cybersecurity, and non-use of hostile data. Yeah, that's okay, Article 15. So, CE marking. Without it, AI does not sell in US. So, declaration of high risk AI to be observed and affixed as C marking, Article 49. And uh, distribu dis distributor to check C marking of AI products, Article 27. And what is C marking? CE is based on harmonized European norm regulation, EU number uh, 1025 2020. So, if you are very interested in this C marking, please uh, check this document. <clears throat> C marking is an administrative marking used by manufacturers or importers to verify compliance with EU health, safety, and environmental protection standards for protocols sold within the EU, European economic area. After high risk AI is put to practical use, we should do many things. Take immediate action to make necessary corrections when something goes wrong. Actually, Article 21. Registration in EU database on high risk AI, Article 60. Monitoring of post market operation and retention of uh, operation status records, Article 61. Incident reporting obligation, Article 62. Mm. All of these are very, also very heavy, heavy burden for AI company. For instance, if autom autom um, automatic driving vehicle, which is kind of AI, and every car which drives by AI is obliged to this new AI act. So that kind of thing is very, heavy, very, very heavy burden for car companies. So it seems to be very controversial and still 
as, as far as I know, car companies are not so, how to say, welcoming this AI act. Uh, finally, the fine is always very focused, but fine is, well, this fine is upper limit, and uh, why is that Google is uh, prosecuted by EU and uh, battling each other in court. And sometimes kind of money is uh, paid as a fine, but the maybe I think the money spent to hire the lawyers is much more higher, <laughs> much, not much, but very big in companies. And uh, maybe Google is very rich country and uh, hired very sophisticated, high skill lawyers. So that is what Google is so strong in EU. And in EU, the, as far as uh, the, from the standpoint of the AI Act, the GDPR, Google is the strongest. Other EU companies are not so strong. So, Google is only one winner in EU. <laughs> that is a kind of the, how to say, irony of the EU GDPR and maybe EU AI Act. Now, rules for generative AI. Two years ago, generative AI coming out. And uh, also, the EU AI Act the introduced a regulation about generative AI. Uh, and uh, this is uh, some kind of the summarize of uh, regulation about generative AI. Most commonly is additional transparency requirement. Transparency is very important because the AI, or especially generative AI, is black box. Many people said so. And even the developers think AI is a black box. So the transparency is very important from the common sense, but actually it's very difficult to make transparent AI. But anyway, EU people think transparency is hmm, possible, but I don't think it's possible anyway. <laughs> if content was generated by AI, it must explicitly state so. Design models to avoid generating illegal content. A summary of copyright data used in learning is available. If the service is in EU, learning is subject to EU law, requiring output of learning data. So that, that's um, not so scrutinize the inside of AI, but again, output of AI or input of AI is strongly regulated by these sentences. Chain of command. The EU chain of command is like this. European Commission, Commission is the highest. The European Parliament and the Council is the next. And the European Artificial Intelligence Board uh, it is newly established by Article 56 to 59. And then the National Service, uh, multinational supervisory authorities uh, organization, there is a supervisory authority for each country in the EU. Yeah, that is a chain of command. So again, EU mentality, without laws, no technology is applied in the society. And it is a risk-based approach. But what are the risks caused by AI? If AI has so high accuracy that incidents occur very rare, say 0.00001%, the risk is very low. And uh, if the uh, percentage is so low, the risk is, is, since risk is incident probability times cost of damage, so risk is coming to be very small. But EU's risk-based approach is actually expected cost-based approach. So there is, how to say, 
they are not so interested in the probability of accident or incident happens. But the cost of accident or incident is their main concern. But the most important thing to my to my standpoint is unnoticed risk or generative AI. Gen this is not so strongly the advocated, but the, I think the very important if we use generative AI uh, as ordinary citizens. So generative AI's output is based on the learning data previously exist, you know. Then the completely new idea or new but min minority idea tends to be ignored. That is a very great risk and maybe it's anti-innovative, you know. So in that sense, in that sense, that means anti-innovative, it's a great risk in this rapidly changing society or rapidly developing AI technology. In addition, if AI, generative AI uses its output as a learning data, the knowledge becomes fixed and uh, nothing new will be generated. So it, it, uh, its output. And then this, uh, the, has some kind of circle is starting, and so nothing new come out. Come out. That is uh, some, the, several years ago, uh, the, there are paper saying this is really the happen in actual AI, actual generative AI. <clears throat> Okay, this is the first part of this talk, and then I move to the second part, AI as a legal agent. T totally different topic. Long story, we have a long story of legal personhood for AI. So the first researchers who talk about this topic is Lawrence Solon, the legal personhood for artificial intelligence, 1992. Then the third restatement of agency is, which is a US law, the 2000, 2006 or something like that. And this is a regulation about agency. And then 20 years later of Lawrence Solomon's paper, J. Chopra and White write a great book, A Legal Theory for Autonomous Artificial Agents, 2011, and Hugo Pagaro, uh, write many papers and books, The Laws of Robots, 2013, up to Quest for the Legal Personhood of Robots, 2018. And in Japan, Kunifumi Saito, who is a professor of Keio University, wrote a very important paper, uh, Granting Judicial Personality to Artificial Agents, 2017. And this year, may maybe very young researcher, Norm Court, write Governing AI Agent. So, in the monotheistic world, in Japanese, Shinkyo no Sekai, there is a God. God makes everything, creators, only creators. Then human is also created by God. So there is a war that cannot be overcome. And human beings create AI. This is a creator, and this is a created thing. So, there will also be a war that cannot be overcome. That is a sense of monotheistic world uh, philosophy. Then the number of person who give full personality to AI, very, very few or almost none. Not personally, but full-fledged, full legal, legal personality. That is not human personality, but legal personality, that when the company has legal personality. Quite, quite few. And partial legal personality, it's not so big, but uh, compared to the, these, there are many more researchers in this, have, having this opinion. Um, but, but many of researchers think AI, is simply a tool, including majority of Japanese lawyers, uh, excluding 
quick recital, as I said before. <clears throat> now, Lorenz Solm. Uh, actually, legal personality has two types, natural person's personality and legal entity, such as co company's personality. The something is missing theory to oppose, to give AI legal personality. Uh, that is a very famous and very popular story to oppose giving AI, AI a legal personality. So something is what? Soul, consciousness, intention, emotion, sense of right and wrong, free will. Then, Solm said, if AI, become, AI behaves as if it has these things, then something is missing argument is not valid as long as there are no concrete evidence to deny it. Yeah. But they very strong, how to say, opinion. And other opinion is that AI does not feel pain, so punishment does not satisfy the victim's retributive feelings. Yeah, as a human, it's seemingly great, but Solom said the legal entity itself, a company, for instance, company, has no concept of suffering or having pain, or feeling pain, but the criminal law can punish the legal. Then, Chopra and White papers. <clears throat> uh, in what follows, we will describe AI agent in terms of not meaning the principal AI human, principal human AI agent, but AI behaves like a legal, like a legal agent of the principal. The considering the issue of granting legal personality to AI agent as a contractual issue, issue on contract. To analyze the agency of AI agent, knowledge is attributed to the AI agent, and there must be, to, uh, must be a way to further attribute that knowledge to the person who is a client. In other words, whether an AI agent should be legal agent is economic, and technical question. So if AI is his or her tool, then AI's knowledge is automatically his or her own knowledge. However, the complexity of AI makes this assumption doubtful. Complexity, in other words, black box. Then, in order to avoid argument on this point, we should give AI a kind of legal position, is what Chopra and White said. Of course, there are many pro the technical problems over here, but I skip this. Then, recently, many, many opposition opinion are over there, but I would like to skip to save the time. There are the many opinions, but the hardest one is here. Marshall Brandeis. Okay, hardest one. The impact of AI has not been assessed. The bias and unfairness of AI uh, has not been recognized. And three, guardrails of making AI obey the laws, of, laws or suppress the dangers of AI are not in place. Then, until these are resolved, AI should be brushed aside without accepting the speed-oriented tech culture. She is an uh, enemy of tech culture. <laughs> but they are this kind of the lawyers in the world. So the, there are much more the mild researchers over here, but I skip, and most important, a researcher is Ugo Pagaro. He is an Italian uh, lawyer, and maybe he is working in the United States at this moment. So the, he said, even in a set of perfect moral actors uh, like angels, rules are needed. But it is important to experiment in an open environment to find out what kind of rules are needed. That, that is his 
uh, idea about the question of this uh, type of logic. So avoid, avoid, avoid establishing a moral status for AI agents that would require granting them full legal responsibility. So the, he put some ridiculous cases. First one is Caligula force. You know Caligula force? Ca Caligula is a third employer of Roman employee, Roman Empire. And then he appointed his force as a senator. So that's ridiculous things. That kind of thing is very, maybe forbid, should be forbidden. Or recently, Sophia, which is an AI application that has acquired citizenship in Saudi Arabia. This is last year or so. So the ridiculous thing is still continuing. So the, to avoid these kind of ridiculousness, the giving personal, giving, and giving legal personality to someone or something has always been very delicate and controversial or even political issues. And uh, Umo Pagaro's program is here. First, A, avoid the hypothesis of giving AI robots full-fledged legal personality. It's a EU, EU, EU Commission's 2018's recommendation. B, accountability and liability possibilities, for example, new forms of AI liability should be explored for the complex disability liability of autonomous vehicles. Autonomous, what is a responsibility of autonomous vehicles? It's a controversial issue at this moment. Legal experiments test new accountability and liability in an open environment. Open environment testing is very important, is what he insists insist, strongly insisted. Some legal policies in existing areas, such as Japanese special zone system, since 2003, that the Japanese talk. And not expand the evidence, and to expand the evidence based rules based on the, this test. Finding new forms of legal representation that are reasonable and efficient for difficult cases is what we should do at this moment. It's the, what the Uo Pagaro said. So legal entity is a person or a legal entity that has legally recognized rights and obligations and is capable of performing legal acts. Specifically, it is an entity that can enter, in, enter into contracts, file lawsuits, and it has own, its own asset for compensation in case of it does not comply with the contract or does some illegal behavior. And if AI is a legal entity, liability is limited within it. And the story is very simple, not back to the AI developer or AI users. All, 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 all the thing is limited with AI itself, if AI is legal status, has legal status. The, as you know, the legal entity has two types, the natural person and non-human legal entities such as companies. So, as you know, the natural person, AI is not a natural, natural person, but AI could be non-human legal entities as companies, is what I would like to say in this talk. And also, this is a opinion coming from Ugo Pagaro. <clears throat> if the AI becomes a legal entity, it will be disconnected from the AI, as I said before, it is disconnected from the AI developer, as I said before, and meaning that AI de developer will no longer be liable. If it is not so, AI developer is uh, very reluctant to develop AI system. Indeed, it would be much simpler story if AI becomes a legal entity and behaves as a legal agent. Now, we introduce two types of AI, tool AI. 
to the AI acts according to the commands of the natural person who is principal of AI. She is a principal of AI and she、uh, requests or orders this to the AI. And to the AI is based on this request to the AI selling or buying or make some contact to outside parties. Of course, there is a developer provider of this to the AI. And the result is reported to this principal. This is a tool AI. And maybe tool AI comes to be very smart if we use generative AI technology. The, so many documents coming from the principal and the communication with the principal is used to enhance the large language models of this tool AI. So tool AI coming to be very, how to say, intellectual、uh, AI. And even have different looks. So, tool AI acts as ordered by, by its principal and make contracts with the counterparty. The result of action is transmitted to the principal AI with certain time delay. This is an important point. This means that the principal has no choice to refuse to confirm the action done by the tool AI because tool AI is just a tool of the principal, natural part principal. Then she couldn't refuse to accept it. That's the limitation of tool AI's, how to say, legal position. Actually, tool AI doesn't have, no, doesn't have legal position at all. So, since the tool AI is not a legal entity, AI's liability falls on the principal or even to the AI developer. To cope with this situation, you have to determine the upper limit of loss that can be compensated by the AI developer. So, the contract between AI, AI users and AI developer is very complicated one. Now we need to use the other type of AI, corporate AI. Corporate AI understands, understand not just doing what he or she, what it is said, but understand the request of natural person, principal, and then the interpret it and act according to the principal's intention. So this AI is very intellectual one. And have some kind of legal knowledge or maybe knowledge about it. And then doing some action based on his interpretation and buy,、uh, buying, selling, or making some contact and reporting back to the principal. That is the difference between two AI. Corporate AI has the capacity to act and enter into contract by itself, where corporate AI is an AI which interprets. Or even guesses its principal's intention from what the principal requests. In other words, corporate AI is a legal AI agent of the principal. The AI has its own asset for compensation in case of it does not comply with the contract or does some illegal behavior. A corporate AI is, as I said before, The corporate AI's liability is limited within it. It's a very simple story. <laughs> When the tool AI acts and makes contact, how can a tool AI provider avoid liability caused by tool AI? So, if we'd like to use tool AI, still, we'd like to tool AI, not The corporate AI, but tool AI, what kind of thing we should do? So, if a complex AI system cannot be debugged completely and the predictability of its action is not 100%, there is still room to consider it as a defect of AI, meaning that the AI developer is liable because of product liability law. This program can be solved by AI becoming a legal entity such as corporate AI because corporate AI has its own asset and use it as a compensation. 
全 c o r p o r a t e AI developer and providers are not liable for product liability even if predictability is not 100%. And actually, AI's, today's AI, the predict, the, its predictability of AI's action is com, not completely predictable. Maybe 50% or 6%, something like that. Now, counter argument. If a tool AI or its developer can utilize insurance in case, or in case where the damage the tool makes, it has the same effect of corporate AI. Now, he said, insurance is very useful. And if we combine insurance and the tool AI, it's okay. So why we need corporate AI? It only will make legal frame complicated, is what the tool AI side people said. However, since insurance fee is expected to be very high, AI developer are very reluctant to develop AI agent because expected insurance fee is very high. So, but. And the other funny story is this. What will happen for a tool AI when its principal dies? All the people eventually died. So this is eventually happened. After the principal dies, the loss is capacity uh, by dementia. There is no one to properly manage the AI. So they are coming to be zombie AI. So zombie AI, bad part of zombie AI is easy hijacked or spoofed identity theft, like spoofing or hijack. So it's a very bad situation. So the ability to know as soon as possible of biological or informational death of the principal and to stop its any action is necessary even for the tool AI. However, it's difficult for tool AI alone to have this capacity of realizing principal's death. Biologically or informationally, principal death is very hard to realize. So it's necessary to establish an AI user environment in which natural persons such as principal's relatives inform the tool AI of the principal's death. So there are other people, maybe family members or something like that, say something to tool AI or corporate AI. Yeah. It's not so easy even for corporate AI to realize the fact that principal is death or incorporated. The first way is death. First way is death of the principal must be notified to corporate AI by the pre specified person such as principal's relatives or family members. The second way is this. The, if corporate AI is smart enough to detect possibility of possibility of person principal's death or incapacitation, it informs the principal's death to the AI development provider, provider. Then the AI development or provider tries to contact the person who purchased the corporate AI. If fail, try to pre-specify the contact person, maybe relatives, to stop the operation of corporate AI because whether alive or death is so serious matter that must be recognized by a certain natural person, like depicted by this figure. This is the first way. This is the second way. It's much simple. Second way is much... Um, well, not... not <laughs> Only two things are here, but the, this AI should do many things. Anyway. Now, summary of liability is like this. Now, we, I'd like to finish the, some small talks. Two small talks, actually. First small talks is agile governance. Many of you know the agile governance. Many, uh, the, for instance, uh, the... the person who is working at the Japanese government, 
may know the agile governance, which you proposed two, three years ago or so by K. Sancho Committee. <coughs> and agile governance is this. Okay? This is an AI system, and influence on the other side is its input, and its output influence to the other side. So influence, the, this output should be transparent and having some accountability. So then evaluate it, evaluate this, and then sometimes redesign. This is a normal way. But this evaluation should be done by AI because situation is so complicated. And also, AI assists updating design or redesign. But the important point is this outer loop, outer loop. environment changes or risk is changed. See, concept of risk is changed. This kind of thing is we have to change goal. Okay, even if even the goal is to be altered and the system is redesigned, this outer loop is very important. We always uh, focus here, small, but outer loop is, should be focused on either. <laughs> so environmental risk analysis may change goal setting and this is very complicated task and should be done by AI. Okay, this is the first small talk. And second small talk is this. This is much more lighter one. 30 years ago, very famous biologist, Richard Dawkins, wrote books, Selfish Genes. Genes use human as a vehicle to be replaced from time to time so that genes themselves can survive. This is what? Richard Dawkins said. Now, I changed this to 2024. AI uses human as developers to be replaced from time to time so that AI itself can survive. This is a today's situation as far as I am concerned. Thanks. <laughs>